Welcome back! My name is Baller Scuba. This is Video Games Over Time! We are still in 1982, and today we're going to talk about Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is, of course, the sequel to the first Star Trek film, Star Trek The Motion Picture, which is based on the television series Star Trek. We talked about Star Trek previously in its own video. If you are not familiar with the franchise and do not want the story so far spoiled, this video will not have much for you, and I would recommend skipping it. Thank you for your interest, and I hope to see you in the next video. Gene Roddenberry, the original creator of Star Trek and the producer of Star Trek The Motion Picture, began working on a script for a sequel after the release of the first film in 1979. Roddenberry's plot had the Klingons traveling back in time through the Guardian of Forever, first seen on the television show. The Klingons would then prevent the assassination of John F. Kennedy, while the crew of the Enterprise would have to fix the corrupted timeline. However, this script was rejected by Paramount Pictures. The executives at Paramount felt that Star Trek The Motion Picture was not as successful as it should have been and blamed Roddenberry for the lack of success. The executives removed Roddenberry from production of the film, making him an executive consultant instead. Harv Bennett, a new television producer for Paramount, was made producer for the new film. Bennett had seen Star Trek The Motion Picture and found it boring, but Bennett had never seen the original Star Trek television show. So, Bennett started watching episodes of the original show. While watching the episode Space Seed, Bennett came to the conclusion that the first film failed because it lacked a true villain. Bennett decided that the villain from Space Seed, Khan Noonien Singh, would make a perfect villain for the new film. Bennett hired Robert Salin, a college friend and director of television commercials, to produce the film. The idea behind hiring Salin was to produce the film cheaply and quickly. This was in response to the first film being seen as costing too much, as well as taking too long. Bennett also hired Michael Miner as art director for the film. Michael Miner had previously worked on both the Star Trek television show and the first Star Trek film. Bennett wrote his first outline for the film in November 1980. This script, named The War of the Generations, has Captain Kirk investigate a rebellion on a distant planet. During the investigation, Kirk discovers that his son is leading the rebellion against the tyrant Khan, so Kirk and his son team up to defeat Khan. Bennett hired Jack B. Sowards to flesh out the outline into a full script. Sowards was an established television writer, whose credits include episodes of Bonanza and Barnaby Jones. Sowards was able to finish the initial script before the writer's strike of 1981. This draft, named the Omega Syndrome, added the theft of the Federation's most powerful weapon, the Omega System. Although both Sowards and Bennett were not fully happy with this idea. Michael Miner, the art director, suggested changing it from a weapon to a terraforming tool, which would fit into the Star Trek mindset better. So, the weapon Omega system was renamed the terraforming Genesis device. The script for the film was leaked to the public around this time. There was some backlash over how a character was treated, so the script was reworked. Samuel A. Peoples, who had written the Star Trek episode Where No Man Has Gone Before, as well as the pilot episode for Star Trek the Animated Series, was brought on to offer his own script. Peoples' script replaced Khan with two new alien characters, Sojin and Moray, who were so powerful they almost destroy the Earth by mistake. This script was rejected. With a looming deadline, Paramount brought in Nicholas Meyer to rework the script. Meyer had also never seen Star Trek, but was an established writer,
who had written The 7% Solution, a Sherlock Holmes novel and film, and Time After Time, a science fiction film with H.G. Wells pursuing Jack the Ripper. With only 12 days to work, Meyer got suggestions from the team about what worked from previous scripts, and wrote a new screenplay uncredited and without pay, and did it within the necessary time frame. Meyer would continue to write revisions for the script, which he described as Hornblower in Outer Space, referencing Horatio Hornblower, one of the original inspirations for the Star Trek television series. Gene Roddenberry reportedly was not happy with the treatment of Captain Kirk's character in Meyer's script. However, those complaints were largely ignored. The working title of the film changed several times, including The Undiscovered Country and Vengeance of Khan. However, Vengeance of Khan needed to change because Lucasfilm was using a similar title for an upcoming Star Wars film, so the name was changed to The Wrath of Khan. For filming, the decision was made early on to reuse as much of the first film set as possible. An estimated 65% of the film was shot on previous sets. Meyer had given this film a more nautical theme than previous Star Trek treatments, so a few nautical elements were added to the set. Models and footage from the first film were also reused for the new film. The costumes, however, were reworked to represent a different time. Principal photography began on November 9, 1981. Most of the main cast from the television show in the first film reprised their roles for this film. Ricardo Montalban, who had originally appeared as Khan on the television series, came back to play the character in the film. Kirstie Alley was brought on to play Savik, a new Vulcan navigator for the Enterprise. Harve Bennett was initially given a budget of $8.5 million for the film. After seeing the first two weeks of footage, Paramount raised the film's budget to its final point of $12 million, over $33.4 million in 2021. This was far cheaper than the first film's $44 million budget in 1979. Bennett had to keep the film's low budget in mind during almost all aspects of the filmmaking process. Industrial Light and Magic, George Lucas's special effect company, was brought in to create many of the effects and models for the film. Evans and Sutherland, a computer graphics company, was brought in to create graphics for the film, which helped speed production of the shots. The Wrath of Khan was one of the first films to use computer graphics at this level. For the film's score, it was decided that an established composer would be too expensive for the film's budget. 28-year-old James Horner was hired in January 1982 to provide the soundtrack. Although Horner had worked on Wolfen, a 1981 horror film, The Wrath of Khan would be Horner's first major film score. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan was released on June 4, 1982 in over 1,600 theaters across the United States. On its opening weekend, the film would gross over $14.3 million, over $40 million in 2021. That was a new all-time record for an opening weekend. That is the backstory of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. It is now time to talk about the plot of the film. If you have not seen Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and do not want its plot spoiled, now would be the time to stop watching. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. For those that have stayed, Let's talk about the plot of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. The film opens with Admiral James T. Kirk watching a training session led by Captain Spock. Lieutenant Savik is running a simulated mission to save the Kobayashi Maru. However, Klingon cruisers come and critically damage the ship. 
The point of the simulation is to test the leadership of the trainee in a no-win situation. Dr. McCoy then visits Admiral Kirk to wish him a happy birthday. Seeing that Kirk is depressed, McCoy advises Kirk to get a new command on a ship instead of sitting behind a desk. Meanwhile, the Starship Reliant is on a mission to find a dead planet to test the Genesis device. The Genesis device is capable of reorganizing dead matter into a habitable world. However, when Captain Terrell and Commander Chekhov beam down to a planet they believe to be SETI Alpha 6, they are captured by genetically engineered tyrant Khan Noonien Singh. Khan reveals that the planet is actually SETI Alpha 5, where Khan and his genetically engineered followers had been exiled 15 years earlier by Kirk. Khan explains that the neighboring planet exploded, devastating this planet's surface and killing Khan's wife and several other followers. Khan then uses mind control eel larvae to take over the Reliant. Khan finds out about the Genesis device and attacks the space station Regular One where the device is being developed. The developers are Kirk's ex-lover, Dr. Carol Marcus, and their son, David. The Enterprise receives a distress signal from Regular One. Kirk is on board and takes command of the Enterprise and sends it to Regular One to help. However, the Reliant, led by Khan, ambushes the Enterprise. Khan tries to negotiate with Kirk, but Kirk stalls while the Reliant's shields are lowered, which allows Kirk to launch a counterattack. Khan is forced to retreat and repair the ship. The Enterprise goes to Regular One. Several crew members beam down to Regular One to rescue the scientists. However, Terrell and Chekhov have been programmed to kill Kirk. Terrell kills himself rather than give in, while Chekhov collapses as the eel larva leaves his body, so Kirk is unharmed. However, Khan is able to transport the Genesis device aboard the Reliant. Khan intends to leave Kirk on Regular One with no means of escape. However, Kirk and Spock have worked out a rendezvous, and Kirk is able to get off the planetoid. Kirk then commands the ship to go into the Mutara Nebula, which disables shields and compromises the targeting system. This puts the Enterprise and the Reliant on an even playing field. Spock points out to Kirk that Khan's tactics show an inexperience with three-dimensional battlefields, so Kirk uses this tactic to his advantage to defeat Khan and the Reliant. Khan, while dying, activates the Genesis device. While the Enterprise is aware of the activation, they are unable to escape in time due to a malfunctioning warp drive. Spock goes into the warp drive, which is flooded with radiation. Spock is able to repair the warp drive, and the Enterprise is able to escape the nebula, which forms a new planet due to the Genesis device. However, Spock succumbs to radiation poisoning. Spock tells Kirk not to grieve Spock's death, as his decision to sacrifice himself to save the ship was the logical decision. We then watch Spock's funeral, as his casket is shot out of the ship toward the newly formed planet with the Genesis device. We then see Spock's casket on the surface of the planet as the film ends. The film would go on to gross around $97 million worldwide, over $270 million in 2021. Although this was less than the first film, The Wrath of Khan's lower budget made the film more of a success than the first film. The audience has often seen this film as the best that Star Trek had to offer. It is also often seen as the film that saved Star Trek. The critics were far more positive on The Wrath of Khan than they were for the first film. In particular, the film was seen as far closer to the original Star Trek in spirit, and the pacing and acting was seen as an improvement over the first film. 
However, the film's perceived melodrama and lackluster action sequences were seen as its downfall. Spock's death, which had been leaked and was what received the backlash from the fans, became an iconic scene for the franchise. The decision to kill one of the most beloved characters of the franchise was risky, but it proved to be one that worked for Star Trek. It was also one of the ways to get Leonard Nimoy to reprise his role as Spock to begin with, as Nimoy was hesitant to revisit the character. To coincide with the release of the film, a novelization of the film, written by Vonda N. McIntyre, was published. That novelization would reach the New York Times bestseller list and remain there for three weeks. Unlike the first film, The Wrath of Khan did not have a lot of merchandise released with it. In particular, no action figures were released with the film. The film would be released on home media in 1982 and 1983. The 1983 VHS version would sell 120,000 copies, the most of any VHS tape at the time. This was attributed to its low price of $39.95, just under $108 in 2021. The film industry would change how they priced VHS tapes primarily due to the sales of the Wrath of Khan VHS tape. Due to the success of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, the Star Trek franchise would be as popular as it had ever been. We will continue to follow the Star Trek franchise as we continue. That means that we will continue to follow the characters and the actors as we continue as well. That will do it for the story of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, for now. My name is Baller Scuba. This has been Video Games Over Time. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video when we continue to talk about aliens.